Good morning and welcome everyone on uh, Sunday, September the 10th, 2023. It always amazes me this year how time is flying past. For those of us who are online, we are having uh, technical problems with our Wi-Fi this morning and we're doing our best to overcome them. You might find the connection is a little spotty. If, it end, if you end up losing it, we'll try to keep it going through the service. You might have to re-sign in again. And uh, we hope that that works well, but our apologies. There's work going on across the street which seems to be affecting our Wi-Fi connection. Um, and anybody who's watching online later who doesn't know me, I'm uh, Maureen Walter, the minister of the church. We're delighted to have our music director, Mrs. Grace Hahn, with us today. And also we have a soloist, Emily. Emily, you told me your last name. Rasha. Rasha. 10 seconds ago she told me and I have to ask her again. <laughs> Thank you so much. We're thrilled to have you with us, both of you. For thousands of years, this land has been the traditional home of the Huron-Wendat, the Seneca, and most recently, the Mississaugas of the Credit River. It's still home to indigenous people from across Turtle Island. We're grateful to work, live, and worship on this land. Our call to worship is printed in the bulletin. The Lord is my strength and my shield in whom my heart trusts. So my heart exalts, and with my song I give thanks to the Lord. Let us worship God. We'll open by singing hymn number 81, Unto the hills around do I lift up, and we'll sing verses 1, 2, and 4.
Let us join together in prayer. Let us pray. pray. God of all kindness, we thank you for the many ways your love comes into our lives. You have filled our mouths with laughter and our tongues with singing. Accept our sacrifice of praise and song and worship in your church on earth today and grant us always a part in the music of your church in heaven through all eternity. Help us, O Lord, to always acknowledge your greatness, to gather together to worship you, and help us to remember that you are a loving and a forgiving God who helps us even when we end up doing things that scare us or worry us, and we pray that you would help us always find our best path forward. Help us to keep in mind your teachings, to do justice, to love mercy, to walk humbly with you, and to remember that we are yours and you are always with us. In the name of Christ we pray, amen. Be assured that in the mercy and love of God, we are a forgiven people. And this day is a new day and a fresh start for each one of us. Amen. We're going to read responsively a part of Psalm 119, 119. We will start at verse 33 and read down to verse 40. Teach me, O Lord, the way of your statutes, and I will observe it to the end. Give me understanding that I might keep your law and observe it with my whole heart. Lead me in the path of your commandments, for I delight in it. Turn my heart to your degrees and not to selfish gain. Turn my eyes from looking at vanities. Give me life in your ways. Confirm to your servant your promise, which is for those who fear you. Turn away the disgrace that I dread, for your ordinances are good. See, I have longed for your precepts. In your righteousness, give me life. Amen, and thank you. This morning from the Old Testament, we're going to read from the book of the prophet Ezekiel, chapter 33, verses 7 to 11. Uh, this is God uh, talking to Ezekiel and outlining his role as a prophet in Israel. Son of man, I have made you a watchman for the house of Israel. So hear the word I speak and give them warning from me. When I say to the wicked, O wicked man, you will surely die. And you do not speak out to dissuade him from his ways. That wicked man will die for his sin, and I will hold you accountable for his blood. But if you do warn the wicked man to turn from his ways and he does not do, do so, he will die for his sin, but you will have saved yourself. Son of man, <clears throat> say to the house of Israel, this is what you are saying. Our offenses and sins weigh us down and we are wasting away because of them. How then can we live? Say to them, as surely as I live, declares the Sovereign Lord, I take no pleasure in the death of the wicked, but rather that they turn from their ways and live. Turn, turn from your evil ways. Why will you die, O house of Israel? Some versions translate that choose to live. <laughs> In our epistles, we're reading from Paul's letter to the Romans, chapter 13, 
uh, starting at uh, verse 8 down to 14. In the Pew Bibles, it should be around uh, page 1189. Let no debt remain outstanding, except the continuing debt to love one another. For he who loves his fellow man has fulfilled the law. The commandments, do not commit adultery, do not murder, do not steal, do not covet, and whatever other commandment there may be, are summed up in this one rule. Love your neighbor as yourself. Love does no harm to its neighbor. Therefore, love is the fulfillment of the law. And do this understanding the present time. The hour has come for you to wake up from your slumber, because our salvation is nearer now than when we first believed. The night is nearly over. The day is almost here. So let us put aside the deeds of darkness and put on the armor of light. Let us behave decently as in the daytime, not in orgies and drunkenness, not in sexual immorality and debauchery, not in dissension and jealousy. Rather, close yourself, clothe yourself with the Lord Jesus, and do not think about how to gratify the desires of the sinful nature. And Julie Gengadine, one of our session members, will read our gospel lesson. Morning. Today's gospel lesson is Matthew chapter 18, verses 15 to 20, and is found in your Pew Bibles on page 1028. If your brother or sister sins. Go and point out their fault, just between the two of you. If they listen to you, you have won them over. But if they will not listen, take one or two others along so that every matter may be established by the testimony of the two or three witnesses. If they still refuse to listen, tell it to the church. And if they refuse to listen even to the church, treat them as you would a pagan or a tax collector. Truly I tell you, Whatever bind, whatever you bind on earth will be bound in heaven, and whatever you lose on earth will be lost in heaven. Again, truly I tell you that if two of you on earth agree about anything they ask for, it will be done for them by my Father in heaven, for where they are two or three gather in my name, there am I with them. The word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. Our hymn is number 640, 640 softly and tenderly.
Let us pray. May the words of my lips and the meditations of our hearts be acceptable in thy sight, O Lord. Amen. In Matthew's Gospel today, we read words of Jesus on resolving problems between members of the community. The conversation is begun when the disciples come to Jesus asking, who is the greatest in the kingdom of heaven? Whatever they were expecting, it was probably not for Jesus to call over a child and tell them they must become humble like a child to be great in the kingdom of heaven. Jesus continues telling them the parable of the lost sheep, which teaches the importance of saving one person who is lost. Then, and this is where we started reading today, Jesus tells them how to act when they have been treated badly by another. When someone has sinned against you, Jesus instructs, go to them alone and tell them the problem. If there is no change, take one or two others with you who can confirm what is going on. If that is also unsuccessful, then bring it to the congregation. Finally, if nothing helps, have nothing further to do with the person. He concludes by telling them the vital importance of community. Community is important for when two or three gather together in Jesus' name, Jesus is there among them. Acting in love, gathering in Christ's name, doesn't only bring people closer to each other, it brings everyone closer to God. Love for one another is key to building the kingdom. We expand our souls when we express love in our daily lives. In these ways of relating to each other, followers of Christ are setting a new pattern. Society in biblical times was not a free and open arrangement. The Roman Empire was a dictatorship supported by military force. There were clear lines of command. The emperor ruled. Underneath the emperor were governors and a whole chain of political command. In the army, there were upper and lower ranks. The upper ranks commanded the lower ranks. No dispute was allowed. Failure to comply was punished harshly. In the same way, Households followed their head. The head of each family made the decisions. These might be informed by family members and even by trusted servants, but in the end, the master's word was final. If the master changed beliefs, for example, the entire household followed. In early days of Christianity, if the master decided to be baptized, everyone in the entire household was baptized. Jesus' instructions propose radical behavior. No one person tells everyone else what to do. Instead, each person uses their own faith and understanding to come to decisions. This is a revolutionary idea. So when Jesus says, if someone sins against you, go and talk to them alone and tell them the problem, that's a new idea. 
Instead of going to a commanding officer or the head of your household to get the problem resolved, two people sit down and work through their issues with one another. Ultimately, if they cannot work through the problem, they agree to differ and part company. It is an idea which encourages people to treat others as equals with respect and kindness. There's a benefit when people resolve their issues together as these resolutions encourage community. When relationships are renewed, community comes together to serve God. When there are as few as two or three, Holy Spirit, Jesus, and God are with them. When they pray together, their prayers, their community, and they themselves are in spirit. The challenge is to show love to each other even when we are not nice. Today's lesson reminds us that we are humans who do not treat each other well. Sometimes we hurt each other. The follower of Christ is not to spend too long living in the turmoil. Instead, we are to make things better. The path to making things right is to treat others with respect, rather than gossiping about how much we dislike someone and how awful they are, or to go to them directly to try to work out the problem. Not every problem can be solved. Then we move on. But before we give up hope, we try kindness, respect, and love. Kindness works over time. It's not unheard of for unresolved conflicts to be healed years later. Love stays with us. We're reminded that someone at some point treated us much better than we had any right to expect. Over the years, the conflict may be forgotten and the love remembered. I recall two family members who had been angry at each other for about three decades. Then they reconciled for no apparent reason other than that they recalled they had once loved each other and cared for one another. They put aside their quarrel and treated each other like true sisters for the rest of their days. Love won. It simply took a few years for it to do so. Kindness is the truth of love. It's amazing how kindness from one person to another can help any situation, no matter how dire. When I was about eight years old, my family, with all of us in the car, mom, dad, my brother, and I, were in a car accident. We were on the Trans-Canada Highway, driving from Alberta to Ontario, in Saskatchewan, near the potash-producing mines. A car coming from the other direction lost control. That driver was young and inexperienced, and faced with an unexpected problem, she overcorrected. Suddenly, she shot into the oncoming lane of traffic, heading directly towards us. All I knew from my seat in the rear was that my father gasped and hit the brakes hard as I watched, he took the keys right out of the ignition. He did everything he could to avoid the collision. 
The crash was loud, sudden, and overwhelming. My brother and I were flung around the back seat. My mother was thrown so hard into the seatbelt that she was covered with bruises for weeks. The oncoming car was not equipped with seatbelts. They were optional back then. And when their doors flung open from the impact, the passengers were thrown out onto the road. The young driver ended up in the mud on the side of the road with the rear tire of her car holding her down. Our peaceful journey was suddenly and chaotically over. It was the single most horrifying event of my childhood. The car, which was new, was demolished. My mother was hurt, my father in shock, my brother and I were quickly herded away from the immediate scene so we could not see the horror that was happening with the people from the other car. Scott and I stood on the side of the road for ages. I remember sobbing. Though it was midsummer, the piles of potash in the nearby fields made it seem as if we were in some foreign country or even planet in winter. The day was gray and rainy. I was utterly heartbroken. There was nothing to be done about it. Everything was ruined. <laughs> then, some people we had never seen before came over and talked to my brother and I. They invited us to come and sit in the back of their car while we waited. My mother waved and nodded to us, smiling, so we went. At least it was dry. These people had been on vacation and were on their way home. They bought some board games to take back to their children. They showed us the games. They unwrapped them. And Scott and I sat in the back seat of their car playing the games. Finally, after an unmeasurable amount of time. We were able to leave. I have no idea how we got from there to where we had to go, some motel somewhere, but somehow it happened. As we were leaving, Scott and I gave the games back to the couple, but they insisted we keep them. Amazingly, I found their kindness made the horrible day much better. They helped a couple of kids overcome fear and shock and allowed us to begin to recover. In fact, everyone, even the young driver crushed under her car, recovered fully. Some things like that car accident are black and white and horrible. And even then, kindness helps. Kindness is important even in the most inopportune moments. So we need to bring that into our every day. In the ordinary transit of life, kindness makes an enormous difference. Life is difficult. Economically, we're all challenged at the moment. The pandemic changed the flow of the economy towards the wealthiest and away from ordinary people. Airline seats get smaller. Mortgages go up. The cost of groceries rises constantly. Many people react to these huge stresses <clears throat> by becoming angry with those who are around them. Trouble is, expressing rage to somebody who happens to be standing nearby does not help the situation at all. Instead, rage escalates bad feelings. 
If we allow rage to overcome us in the moment, we only get angrier. Everyone around is affected. Taking direct action, such as a letter of complaint to the airline who decreased seat size on the plane, is more helpful to affect change. Events cannot create dissension in my life if I refuse to accept it. We are called on to take direct action with Christ and God's love. If, instead of lashing out at each other, two people can be kind, that's radical action. Radical kindness is part of the challenge of following Christ. Instead of raging at one another, we look for opportunities for kindness. Kindness means that when life is tough, especially when life is tough, Rather than blame each other, we help each other through. Even small acts of kindness make us feel better. We face challenges each day. That's part of the human condition. When we treat each other with respect, with integrity, and with love, we are growing the kingdom of heaven. Our actions, as we aim for radical kindness, spread the love of God. We carry God's love into our lives. Live in love and serve the Lord. May we all be blessed with love and kindness as we live. Amen. We have an anthem.
Thank you very much. Can I still wrap this on? Yes. Welcome again. Um, ongoing, ongoing transit and construction work continues to affect us. And uh, we try to keep up with every change in transit and let you know we, we definitely are trying to include in our uh, emails to you each week the latest changes in transit options and then we try to get here and discover they're changed again. <laughs> so <laughs> hopefully we'll all manage to keep coming and thank you so much for everybody who does keep coming. We're thrilled to be here in person and I see we have quite a few online as well, so I'm glad our hotspot uh, Wi-Fi connection is working to keep everybody here. We will be having coffee hour after the service today, and actually it looks like quite a splendid and lovely one with uh, sandwiches, so please uh, take a moment and come out and join us for coffee after the service, either door, that way, uh, behind me or depending on your direction. We're also grateful for all of the offerings that we continue to receive. Uh, we appreciate it very much. We, we have found this year that we may be slightly behind what we were hoping, and we will give you more specific information about that. We're trying to keep people up to date with what's going on. But meanwhile, we're we're very pleased for the ongoing uh, continued support. You can put your offering in the plate at the front, or mail offering to the church, or contact our treasurer, Nancy Stevenson, to organize uh, electronic uh, transmission of funds or uh, pre-authorized remittance. Coming up, a couple of dates to keep in mind. Uh, Presbytery is a little later this month, so our session meeting will be Tuesday, September 19th at 4 p.m. on Zoom. And uh, we are looking forward to celebrating World Communion on the 1st of October this year, so keep that in mind also. Um, we are hopeful, I think, that we're having our choir back next week, so I always get excited about that. Uh, that's... Uh, we hope will go well. I, uh, I think you'll see this week in the email, I also have been sending out a bit of a prayer list of people to keep in our prayers. And uh, at the moment, um, there doesn't seem to be an obvious crisis with anybody right at this moment. But we do have a number of our membership that we're holding in our prayers and uh, continuing to support them. And in general, we're praying for and with each other and thank you very much for all your prayer support of me and also of one another. It's wonderful. Uh, I think we'll talk about uh, maybe after church uh, when we'll schedule our next healing prayer service. Uh, so we'll, we have been doing that in the spring and that's always a good thing. Those are, oh, and there's one other, I'm going to ask Rick Johnson, one of our members, and my beloved, <laughs> to talk a little bit about an idea he's got. Each fall uh, in Toronto, there's a race that uh, is organized, which includes a shorter race for those of us who are not real runners, which can even be walked. But it also, uh, more importantly for this, uh, is an opportunity to uh, assist with fundraising of charities because they may have an electronic platform that uh, is convenient to uh, gather support. And Evangel Hall has for many years, I, at, at least seven, more like 10, has uh, we've tried to organize people who are running to find sponsorship for Evangel Hall. With the uh, pandemic, uh, the race for a time was uh, not occurring in person, it is this year, but there is a virtual element. So I'm trying to, uh, to see if uh, 
if people wish to organize, and I've uh, uh, sent something to Presbytery, uh, an opportunity for, uh, particularly for Presbyterian youth in Toronto, to gather and have a run, walk, to raise money for Evangel Hall mission. Um, but we don't have to do it on the date that um, thousands gather. So I'm tentatively uh, working with uh, Saturday, October 14th, and I will give you more information, assuming it all works out, uh, whether you wish to participate or whether you know people that might wish to run, particularly younger people, or run or walk, or whether you wish to uh, support uh, them in their efforts to raise money for Evangel Hall. So I'll follow up next week, uh, hopefully, uh, Presbytery meeting this week, there'll be developments on that. Um, thank you. And thanks, Rick. And remember, we can all be young at heart. <laughs> one, one of the ideas is that some of us might gather on the Saturday morning in person and do a five-kilometer walk. Uh, but anyway, as Rick says, we'll we'll get some more details. And it may be that even some of our youth might be interested in getting involved. Uh, but we'd be very happy for everybody's participation in whatever way they can. Those are all of our announcements at the moment. We'll continue with our prayer in which we'll give thanks for our offering as well as our thanksgiving and prayers of supplication. Let us pray. Almighty God, in you we live and move and have our being. You have made us for yourself so that our hearts are restless until they find our rest in you. Give us the strength in our hearts of purpose that we might know your will and fulfill it, that in your light we may see light and in your service find our perfect freedom. And as we seek to serve one another and you, O Lord, we are grateful for the gifts that we have been given. We thank you for this portion which we are able to give back to you to demonstrate your love to the world, that your purpose might be shown and made clear, and that your justice and mercy might be put into practice. Bless our offerings, O Lord, and help use them to the best of our ability and to the good of your kingdom. Lord God, your kindness and spirit sets us free and helps us to live in the brightness of your presence, that we may bring your sunshine into cloudy places. We ask that you would take our hands and work with them, take our lips and speak through them, take our minds and think with them, and take our hearts and set them on fire with love for you and for all people that we might share together in the world that you have made. Lord, we remember with prayer and supplication people who are undergoing trauma and difficulty. We pray for the people of Morocco as they deal with the aftermath of earthquakes and we pray for all countries affected by war, by famine, by flood. We ask that there would be help for those who bring help to others. We thank you for responders who go into disaster areas and we pray that you would strengthen them and guide their hands and feet. And we thank you for all medical workers who seek to help us through medical crises. God of all goodness and grace, 
you're worthy of a greater love than we can ever give in our own human hearts. But we pray that you would fill our hearts with your love so that all things may seem possible for us who work together to serve you. And grant that loving you, we might each day become more like you. And finally, that we might know the crown of life which you have promised, that we might be together in your kingdom, together with that great cloud of witnesses by which we are compassed about, all those whom we knew and love who raised us and inspired us. And we thank you for the company of love by which we are compassed about, all those on earth who also seek to serve you. God of love, through your Son, you gave us a new commandment to love one another as he loved us. In his spirit, we ask you for a mind forgetful of past injury, a will to seek the good of others, and a heart full of love for all. Through Jesus Christ, our Lord and Savior, we pray, and we continue to pray as we have been taught, saying, Our Father in heaven, hallowed be your name, your kingdom come, your will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us each day our daily bread, and forgive us our sins as we forgive those who sin against you. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For yours is the kingdom, the power, and the glory forever. Amen. Our closing hymn is number 670, Amazing Grace. You are the children of God, beloved, valued, every one of you vital. Know that God is with you everywhere you go. Grace, mercy, and peace. From God the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, rest and abide with each one of you, now and forevermore.